What's up everyone, Mark here, and on this episode of Mark's Miscellaneous, we're tackling a topic that many of you have probably never thought much about, but one that's among the most important to modern civilization. Before we get started, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel if you're interested in this sort of thing and you haven't already. I have new videos coming out all the time on all sorts of topics, and if you turn on notifications, you'll never miss when the next one comes out. Aptly named the Ocean State, Rhode Island is the smallest state in the country, yet with more than 400 miles of coastline, clean water is central to our way of life. From boating, to surfing, to commercial and recreational fishing, or even just lazing on the beach. If you saw my video on the Situate Reservoir, then you already know the tremendous value we place on clean drinking water, and that it can come at a cost. Clean oceans and waterways are no accident. Every single day, Rhode Island's 19 major wastewater treatment facilities collect, process, and release some 120 million gallons of purified residential, commercial, and industrial wastewater back into the environment. That's a phenomenal amount of wastewater, or what many people commonly refer to as sewage. And it may leave you with questions like, where does all the poop go? Or what happens to the toilet paper? Or even just how? Well, those are exactly the types of questions I aim to answer in this video. During Rhode Island's Clean Water Week in April leading up to Earth Day, I paid a visit to Warwick's wastewater treatment facility for a tour, along with a bit of an education. It was mostly Rob, Ryan, and Nick who led the tour, but Mike, Ed and countless others are working hard in all areas of the facility because they all share a passion for and commitment to making clean water. And it's a fascinating process that's far more clean and far less smelly than you'd think. The Warwick facility receives between four and five million gallons of wastewater or influent on any given day. And that water takes an entire 24 hours to pass fully through the plant and come out as clean water or effluent on the other side. The journey begins at the inlet building, where a giant rotating drum combs the water for debris. Toys, sticks, rocks, and other objects that can clog or damage downstream equipment are removed and transported by conveyor to a disposal area. It's at this point where toilet paper is also removed as a pulp that's similarly disposed of. So-called flushable wipes are filtered out here too. They're only flushable in the sense that you can usually get them to go down your drain without causing a clog. They don't break down like toilet paper and arrive here just as whole as when they left your house. Gross. They're also one of the worst things that can get into the downstream plumbing at a treatment plant. The thicker and longer fibers of wipes, also often synthetic, get caught and bound up in pumps causing costly damage. They can even become entangled with one another and stuck together by fat, which forms clogs known as fatbergs in sewer lines long before they even reach the facility. Next, the water passes through a high-velocity vortex that spins finer debris out of the water in a way similar to how your vacuum cleaner spins dirt out of the air. The collected sand, pebbles, and other material are disposed of along with the other debris. With the wastewater now relatively free of inorganic waste and other foreign material, it moves on to the primary settling tanks. Here, the speed of the flow is greatly reduced, allowing gravity to do most of the work of pulling heavy solid material to the bottom where it collects the sludge, and allowing lighter solid material to flow to the top so it can be skimmed off. This process alone removes approximately 50% of the total solid material from the wastewater stream. While the sludge is pumped off to be handled separately, the cleaner water now heads to the next step, Biological Nutrient Removal, or BNR. The water snakes back and forth through a course of long, deep BNR tanks where it's aerated by high-powered blowers along most of the way. Oxygenation from the air bubbles allows beneficial aerobic bacteria to convert the dissolved ammonia in the water, which is toxic, to inert nitrogen gas, which simply dissipates into the atmosphere. Some, but not all, of the phosphorus, the other main toxin present, is also removed by different bacteria during BNR. The action of the aeration also helps any fats and oils in the water coagulate into a surface foam, which is more easily removed. The sludge in the BNR tanks is highly bioactive with microorganisms that do all of the work, hence the term activated sludge is used to describe it. A portion of it is saved to continue the cycle, while the rest is pumped off to be handled with the other waste sludge. At any given time, roughly 3 million gallons of the tank's capacity is taken up by the bacteria that are keeping the process going. The next stop is the secondary clarifiers. In these large, round tanks, the wastewater is given a further opportunity to settle. Any remaining bacterial waste sinks to the bottom, and the now almost fully cleaned water falls over the edge of a skimming baffle. The clean water is allowed to pass through, and any floating material is held back while a long, rotating skimmer arm drives it towards the center where it's collected for disposal. Similar to the previous step, some of the collected waste bacteria is saved or added back to the BNR tanks, while the rest is pumped away to be handled with the rest of the sludge. Using a tool that works kind of like sticking your thumb on the top of a giant straw, they periodically draw up samples from the clarifiers to monitor the exact depth of the sludge and the increasing clarity of the water as it nears the top of the column. At this point, the water enters the first of two chemical treatment processes, which are the final steps to prepare it for release into the environment. The first of these is phosphorus removal. 
Through the use of chemical additives, any remaining phosphorus not removed through BNR is made to precipitate out of the water as a sort of sediment that can more effectively be removed for disposal. Lastly, the water is disinfected through the addition of a concentrated bleach. The bacteria levels of the final, crystal clear effluent water that's discharged into the adjacent Patuxent River are so low that they're often undetectable with most lab tests. Meanwhile, all of the solids and sludges removed from the water in the treatment process still need to be dealt with. These are further dewatered in gravity thickeners, making them more economical for disposal. Five tons of the resulting thickened sludge each day are trucked away for incineration off-site. Similar to how solid waste is disposed of in centralized landfills, wastewater sludge is often transported for incineration at a centralized plant. In Warwick's case, it's brought to the neighboring city of Cranston's wastewater facility, which incinerates sludge for a number of other area treatment plants in addition to its own. Stringent environmental regulations limit the number of plants burning waste, making this a necessary arrangement. At one time, an on-site digester was used, which further reduced the sludge through an anaerobic bacterial process, with the released methane gas burned off before sending it out for incineration. Due to emissions, its continued use today is precluded by the same environmental regulations which set limits around the incineration of sludge to begin with. You might think that that this is the end, but far from it. While plenty of the plant's processes are automated, they still require maintenance and oversight by facility staff. As you've seen, most of the processes that actually make the water clean here are biological in nature, and as such, they're highly reactive to environmental changes. Periods of heavy water usage or rain can dilute or even partially wash out the charge of beneficial bacteria in the various tanks that literally keep the processes alive. Higher or lower levels of bacteria in the effluent water may require adjustments to the amount of bleach used in order to sufficiently sanitize the water without overdoing it or under doing it. For these reasons, the plant's operations center is staffed 24-7-365 to monitor not only the statuses of the plant and its automated systems, but also those of the 49 pumping stations spread throughout the city and the nearly 320 miles of sewer lines connecting them all to the treatment plant. Staff here in the state-of-the-art laboratory are constantly testing and analyzing to determine both the cleanliness of the water at various stages and the biological health of the beneficial bacteria and the sludges that make the processes work. Technicians also frequently examine samples of the activated sludge under the microscope which allows them to identify and count the organisms living within it. This not only serves as an indicator of the overall health of the sludge, but also its relative age or maturity level, which is important to understand in order to gauge its effectiveness. Here, we see a healthy rotifer, so named because of the rotary action of the cilia at its head, which create a vortex that drives food towards its mouth. For rotifers, food means dead bacteria, algae, protozoans, and other organic debris in the wastewater. Yum! Warwick's wastewater facility, just like the many others across the country, is staffed by a knowledgeable and dedicated team without whom we simply would not be able to have clean water. I'd like to personally thank the entire staff of the Warwick Sewer Authority for the amazing plant tour and their eagerness to inform and educate, which contributed in no small part to the making of this video. If you'd like to learn more about wastewater treatment in the United States, or about the Warwick plant's operations specifically, I've included a few reference links you may want to check out down in the video description. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them too, so don't hesitate to comment below. Lastly, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then I hope you'll take a second to give it a thumbs up, and if you hated it, then just take a second to give it a thumbs down. Again, if you're interested in seeing more of this sort of thing, I have new videos on all sorts of topics coming out all the time, so make sure you subscribe if you haven't already, and turn on notifications so you don't miss when the next one comes out. Again, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time!